Greetings and welcome to the Cancer Interviews podcast. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Bruce Morton. On this podcast, we hear from people on all manner of cancer journeys and no two are alike. But when it comes to colon cancer in a very big way, the journey continues even after one goes into remission. That is most definitely part of the story with our guest on this episode. He is Alex Ramirez of Denver, Colorado, who has survived stage two colon cancer. So let's bring him on. And Alex, welcome to Cancer Interviews. Good, uh, good afternoon, uh, Bruce Morton. First of all, I want to say thank you for having me on this amazing platform. I'm a huge fan of the podcast, and I'm, I'm tickled to have this platform with you. And we're looking forward to hearing your story. Thank you. Very, in a very big way. Now, Alex, we want to start off the way we always start off. And uh, you, of course, have a life that is exclusive of your cancer journey, and we'd like to hear more about it. So if you would, tell us a bit about where you're from, uh, what you do for work, and when you have time for fun, uh, what you do when that sort of uh, time makes itself available, that sort of thing. Sure, sure. I, uh, I, uh, I was born in Denver, Colorado. Um, I am um, the youngest of three siblings. My mom and dad, Miguel and Maria Ramirez, have been married for 52 years, so I look for them as a foundation of how I live my life. Um, very... Uh, very humbled uh, to have a good upbringing. I grew up here in Lakewood, Colorado. Uh, I went to Green Mountain High School. I played football there and uh, a little bit of wrestling. Um, I uh, went to Metro State College and I graduated with a degree in broadcasting journalism with an emphasis in communications with a minor in Spanish. And I've translated that into my career, which is what I do now. I am a sports talk show host here in Denver, Colorado, um, for Mile High Sports Radio for the last nine and a half years. I, uh, in my free time, I, I really enjoy just kind of like laying back and watching movies and hanging out with my, my newly fiance. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, have a, we have a young son, uh, Romeo, and uh, we uh, enjoy our time traveling a lot. We like to go to Mexico quite a bit, and we like to go out quite a bit to go to dinner, and we're kind of foodies, uh, Bruce. Uh, that's my free time when, when I do have that. But for the most part, uh, as you know, someone who's in, in the media and broadcasting world that uh, in Colorado with having four professional sports teams, that kind of can keep you kind of busy. And uh, we, we enjoy that. And that it's sometimes I, I wonder why they even pay me because it doesn't feel like it's work, but uh, I appreciate you asking. Yeah. It's uh, I have a, an interesting life to say the least. It's never the same thing every week. Everything's something always evolving and something's different so but yeah it's um it's been quite a humble journey uh yeah it's just been it's been awesome i, I can't complain about anything right now uh, that's going on i'm as you mentioned and we'll get into that a little bit later as you mentioned but it's been quite the uh quite quite an interesting journey i've had so far in my life okay you're a foodie so what are some of your favorite types of food well mexican food is my favorite food obviously i am latino uh my parents are from mexico from zacatecas Jerez, mexico in Jerez, mexico so we i enjoy and i've and i've had the discussion recently with a couple, a couple friends that uh mexican food for me is i think some of the most healthiest food you can get you know i love avocados avocados are power food i love the vegetables and the beans all the protein that you get out of that the chicken i try to stay away as much as i can from red meat but Mexican food is my favorite, uh, followed by Italian. I love Italian food as well. I like the pastas. I like the sauces that uh, that come with the uh, with the foods. Uh, I just, gosh, I, I mean, Vietnamese food. I love Vietnamese food. It's very healthy as well. I think it's a another food that's very powerful in the in, in, in the food group that is healthy for you as well. So I, I pretty much, Bruce, I I, I like it all, man. Uh, Excuse me. I'm sorry. Uh, I have I have an, uh, an appetite for many many different cultures. I like to explore different kind of food, but for the most part, I, I stick to Mexican food. Though for the most part, now you talked about going to Mexico a number of times. I've yeah. heard many times that Mexican food in Mexico is different from Mexican food that is served here in the states. That's would correct. You, would you agree or disagree? And if so, how? Uh, I, well, it depends on where you go. I mean, I go, uh, I mean, I go to my parents' house quite a bit to eat. Uh, so that food really doesn't change much from Mexican food in Mexico, uh, depending on where you're, what part of Mexico you visit. If you visit a resort town, uh, like a Cancun or a Cabo, things like that, 
obviously it's going to be more of a an Americanized food uh, for with a Mexican twist. You got to be because they got to be careful with the tourists because a lot of times the the palate doesn't translate well when it comes to uh, trying to adapt while you're out there because you're you're really it's a culture shock to the system sometimes of the body. But uh, there are some restaurants here in, in town in Denver, Colorado that use that same rustic recipe that they used to use back in the Aztec days and the Mayan days. And uh, so it just depends on, you know, like I know there's different kind of chili, green chili, some green chili. A lot of people like to use a lot of flour in it. I like my chili with not a lot of flour. Um, you know, there's just many different ways you can, I guess you can describe Mexican food, but yes, there is a difference between Mexican food in Mexico, depending on where you go and Mexican food here in Colorado. Absolutely. Now let's talk about what you do as a talk show host. Yeah. If you think back on the scores of interviews you have done over the years. Is there one that stands out, one that is most memorable, you'll never forget? And if so, why and with whom? Uh, well, that's an easy one for me. That's Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant was doing this farewell tour. I want to say a good five, four and a half years ago, five years ago. And I was lucky enough to be a part of the member uh, to the press uh, in the press. And he was he was in Denver for his last time. And I believe he scored, I believe it was around 50 points. So he had a big night. And I actually, um, I, and I never, knew, I never knew how big the magnitude of the interview I did. I was part of the, the scrum, as you could say, in the media. There were about, I don't know, 10, 12 of us. And I asked them a direct question. I said, hey, you know, your game and Michael Jordan's game have always been compared similarly to each other. How would you rate your game overall compared to his? And he said, oh. And he gave credit to Michael Jordan, saying Michael Jordan was obviously his hero and the greatest to ever play the game. And I thought it was, you know, interesting, cool that he that he gave credit to someone else when I think Kobe Bryant is easily a top five player of all time. And tragically, we lost Kobe Bryant a couple of years ago to the helicopter crash. And uh, so when I went back and I said, well, I remember somebody from the Los Angeles Times uh, took a picture of – like a backdrop of all the, uh, all the press that I was interviewing. And there's a great picture of myself right in his face. And, and I have a microphone in his mouth, in his, hang, in, in his face. And I'm asking him this question. And I had that blown up in my room in my, in my, my man cave as a, uh, as a memoir of like, you know, cause when people would come into my house, they're like, Whoa, that's you. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, that is pretty cool. And obviously his legacy still lives on, but that's an easy one for me. Um, Working at, at, at the radio station has allowed me the liberty to obviously meet a lot of famous athletes, um, get a rub shoulders with a lot of uh, players. Sometimes you you know you get a chance to get go in the back uh, locker rooms where you see a lot of press people, uh, where people that you watch admiring growing up on TV, uh, and you, next thing you know you're in the same room with them, uh, conducting interviews and and talking to. Uh, these great players and athletes and I don't get starstruck uh, as much as I used to at one time, but uh, now it's I just, I just treat it like a, it is a job and um, it's an interesting and it's a, it's a job that helps feed my family. And sometimes, like I mentioned Bruce earlier in this interview that I, I it's interesting that they pay me to do what I do because it's not work. And there, there is a saying that goes, uh, you know, you, you'll never work another day in your life. Uh, if you do something that you love and that's it's the absolute truth. Boy, you can say that again. By the way, if you like what you hear on this segment, we invite you to subscribe to our podcast by clicking on the links below. Once there, you will see a bell icon. And if you click on that, we will notify you when we post a new interview. Now, Alex, I want to get to the, the part of your life that, uh, that has brought us here together at this point and, uh, and and that would uh, pertain to your cancer journey and for for each of us who has gone through a cancer journey and is going through a cancer journey there was a there was a juncture there was some point in which something did not seem normal something that uh, sadly unfortunately demanded medical attention for you what was that well uh, first of all I'm a diabetic uh, well, I'm a type 2 diabetic so I, I don't take insulin shots, but I do take metformin. Uh, I take about 1,000 milligrams a day, which is uh, two pills of 500 milligrams each. And what happened in early 2020 is I, uh, I went in to go see my physician and to get a refill on my medication. And 
she had mentioned, hey, we haven't seen you in a while, Alex. So let's go ahead and get some blood work done. And I, and I, easily, and I, I could have easily have ignored that request for the blood. And I could have used, uh, uh, you know, my mom and my brother are also uh, type 2 diabetics. We all use the same kind of medication. And I could have easily said, you know what, I'll just, I don't have time for it. Or I don't, you know, I didn't. I, I just completely, I said, well, you know what, this is not a bad idea. I might as well do it. I haven't been blood tested in a while. Uh, but leading up to that point, Bruce, what had happened also, I was feeling really tired. I was, I was feeling really weak throughout the day. Uh, I, I didn't have a lot of energy. And I knew something just was off with my body. My overall, I wasn't feeling as strong as I normally felt waking up. And I would get tired in the afternoon. I would take naps that I would never, really, I'm not a nap person. And what happened was uh, the results came back from the doctor and the doctor said, Hey, you're severely anemic and we need to get you on iron immediately, like today. So she uh, referred me to some iron, some uh, uh, tablets that I started taking, which are pretty strong, pretty, they really, they can tear up your stomach right away if you're not used to them. And I, I was taking those and she said, I'm also going to recommend you to get a colonoscopy right away too to find out what seems to be the problem because you're losing blood somewhere that we don't know where it's where you're losing it from so that triggered off a colonoscopy exam probably three days after my blood work because that's how serious you had wanted me to get in to see a, a you know a doctor so she sent me to a gi specialist and when i went to get this colonoscopy the doctor that same day which is weird i was still kind of like half dazed out from the anesthesia, but he had mentioned, he said, hey, just as I suspected, we found a small tumor in your um, colon. And it is, it is cancerous, he said, but we won't, we won't know immediately the, the magnitude of it until we send it over to labs and they're gonna do the blood, they're gonna do the work on it to see what, you know, how it comes back. And so I had to wait gosh, I want to say 72 hours, which is probably the longest 72 hours of my life, Bruce, uh, to find out what exactly, uh, if it really was cancer, or if it was just a mass or what it was. And it came back that it was, uh, the labs came back and they said that it was cancer. So his recommendation immediately was to get it operated on and get it removed. But prior to that happening, I almost felt like a lab animal because I had to do uh CAT scans, MRIs, uh, they did, I had to go to a cardiologist, I had to pass a, 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 all these different tests. It seemed like it was a never ending story when it came to getting all these pre-surgery exams done before um, the actual surgery itself. Um, and so that was the challenge in, in itself, just because I wasn't used to you know, getting uh, you know, going through cat, I didn't know what a cat scan really even was or what an MRI did or what the purpose of it was. I was getting blood work every other day. It was just, it was just a very stressful time that I didn't know how to handle that. Um, moving forward, uh, I went and got the operation done. And needless to say, um, we had complications after the first procedure. Five days later, I had grown an infection in my in my colon area where the intestines uh, were where, where, the, where the actual uh, tumor was at and it wasn't a small tumor it was a baseball sized tumor uh, that was removed and I, I really didn't know what to make of that uh, I was kind of like in a daze Bruce you could almost say for a good two or three days after the procedure because they had put me on this floor at the hospital and I do want to say thank you to all the people, the wonderful people at St. Anthony Hospital for uh, allowing me to be here today to do this interview with, uh, with you, Bruce. It's been, uh, it's been a journey, but I want to say thank you to all the wonderful doctors and nurses out at St. Anthony's Hospital because they really were, uh, they were there for me. But moving forward, after the first procedure had happened, I had run an infection and I went in on a Monday, and that Friday, the first Friday, um, I had gone septic, uh, meaning, and I didn't know what the word septic even meant until I, I had to Google it, literally Google it. My heart, my heart pressure was at 177 to 180. My uh, 
temperature was at like 107, 108. I was cooking inside from what I, from, from what the doctor told me. What's interesting, and I'll never forget this, Bruce, is I saw my doctor, and I'll, I'll mention his name, Dr. David Beck, an amazing surgeon. He was dressed in street clothes when I saw him. I was in the ICU room when I saw him. I'm like, what am I doing in ICU, doc? And what are you doing out of your scrubs? And he said, I'm here to save your life, Alex. He's like, you're very, very sick. And I'm like, I, and I told him, I said, I, I felt fine. I, I didn't have any issues. I, I felt like I didn't. He said, yeah, but your blood work and your, your pressure, your white blood cell count. I mean, everything was just out of whack. So he said, call your mom, call your dad, call your sister, call your fiance, call your family, let them know what's happening. And I'm like, why would I do that? He said, because. I said, because why? He said, because this might be it. Just like that. It, that day moving forward, I mean, I'll never forget what the doctor said to me. He said, this could be it. And, and doctors don't have time to sugarcoat stuff and play around and give you, you know, false hope. He gave me the real reality of this could be it. And um, so uh, I had the second procedure done. They cleaned out the infection. I got, I was in ICU for three nights. I had tubes in my nose that were still sucking out the infection. Um, I don't want to get too graphic, but it was pretty nasty. Three days later, I grew another infection, Bruce. Um, at this time, the infection had really spread into the intestine area. The best way, to, the best way for our listeners and your audience to understand, when they remove a tumor from your intestine or your colon, it's like grabbing a garden hose, cutting the garden hose in half, and then reconnecting it because there's a kink in the middle of the garden hose and stapling it. Well, what happened is when it was stapled back, it's such a nasty, dirty uh, operation that there's a, the, the risk for infection is high. And that's exactly what happened is I got infected again for the third time. I had three operations in less than 17 days. Um, it, was, it was horrible. Well, what the doctor said at that point, Bruce, he said, we're going to let your big intestines rest and we're going to give you what's called an elastomy bag, which is basically uh, they cut out an intestine out of your stomach next to your belly button. And this intestine is the first intestine that goes down your, 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 you know, your, 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 your throat. So whatever you, when you're eating, Immediately, that's the first tube that it goes down, and it, it it leaves your body within about an hour, maybe. So if you eat like cereal or you have a banana, within an hour, it's it's a, it's an anosmia bag. Um, I will tell you that it, it was the hardest. I, I had the bag for three months, not knowing that if it was be if it would be permanent or not, Bruce. I had no idea um, because the intestine was so damaged that they wanted to give us some time to heal and rest and the infection to go away. Well, when I was released after 24 days, it was 23, 23, 23, 23 and a half days out of the hospital. I left the hospital with a womb vac, which is a vac that is connected to your stomach where the scar is, where they went in to do the operation. And what it does, it, it helps it uh, seal faster and close quicker. It's like a suction, but that's still, it, it's a pain because you had to carry it around like it was an oxygen tank. I had a pick line on my left arm because I had an infection. I had E. coli still when I left the hospital, but I had to, I had to have an IV, I had, I had to have an IV bag. Uh, it was like a gel ball that uh, you would change. I had it for 14 days and then I had the ostomy bag. So I had those three things going for me when I left. Uh, I went into the hospital at 219 pounds. I left the hospital at 174 pounds. So the weight loss was incredible. Alex, now let me ask you this before we go on. Uh, the ostomy bag, the other things, they don't maintain themselves. Somebody has to maintain it. And uh, in many instances, when we talk to those on colon cancer journeys, it, it ends up being uh, the patient who maintains it. 
Did you have to maintain the ostomy bag in those uh, first few weeks and months, or was there every day, milk? every day, every day, Bruce? Um, I had a home care nurse come three days a week to my house to uh, check on my wounds to make sure they were closing well, and they would also help me with the uh, adhesiveness of these bags. So, one of the things I will say that I'm disappointed in with the hospital is. When I left the hospital, no one really told me what an ostomy bag was. I mean, maybe it was because I was on pain meds and, and I wasn't thinking clear and I wasn't really paying attention, but I don't think they did a very good job on explaining to me the magnitude of what an ostomy really was and, what, and how to maintain it and how to clean it and how to change it. So I had, uh, for the first couple of weeks, maybe up to a month, I had some real growing pains um, with the bag because, as you mentioned, you have to maintain it. Um, the bag would fill up, and this is kind of gross, and I know it's just, it's just part of my journey, but in order for, for our listeners and the podcast audience and that's going to be watching this interview to understand this, and they'll know what, what I'm talking about is sometimes the bag leaks. Um, it, I would literally poop on myself because the bag would leak. Um, I wouldn't eat after 4 p.m. because the more you eat, when you're sleeping, you have to constantly check the bag because the bag overflows and then it leaks again. So sleep was really tough for about three months. I would sleep in two-hour intervals because you were always afraid that the bag would overflow and you never had real good rest because you're always sleeping with one eye open checking the bag out and so oh, man is this going to overflow tonight or not um and finally after trials and tribulations and and going to uh the ostomy websites and getting support help through outside sources besides the hospital they would help me with my tapes and my glues and in the uh, meantime, my, my, my stomach area around the back of the ostomy would get irritated because you're putting tape and you're putting glue in order for the bag to stay on. And it was a pretty bad experience, but one of the things and one of the statements from the nurses would always tell me is they would say to me and a lot of your patients that I've listened to your podcasts, a lot of the patients that have come on and that have come on as their testimony have said they, they still use the ostomy bag because they have to use it for the rest of their lives. And I always had the, the, the impression that this was just gonna be a temporary fix or a temporary thing for me. And through the grace of God and through the support of my mom and dad and my sister, everybody, my fiance that have, have stood by me through this, this, through this tough journey, I was able to get it reversed. I've had no issues since the reversal. Uh, I am able to go to the bathroom like a normal person does. And um, to say that this changed my life, it has changed my life. I don't have, I don't, I, I, when I, the little things in life, Bruce, that you take for granted, you, you just, you just, you don't understand our liberties, what we have until they're taken from you. And, that's it's, it's it's been an interesting journey. As you mentioned, it was a type two cancer, uh, stage two. Excuse me. There is a twenty percent chance that it can come back, according to what my oncologist said. Um, but there's an eighty percent chance that it's not going to. So he said those numbers are very very good. Um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's my that's my journey in a nutshell right there when it came to my colon cancer, and it's just been. Um, I think having this platform is talking to you and your audience, Bruce, and hopefully if anybody could, if anybody's, when they start watching this interview and they, if you can get anything from this, it's early detection, check yourselves, make sure that you're getting blood work all, all the time done, making sure if there's a stool sample that's bloody or black, that's not normal. Go get that checked out, go to your doctor, you know, Get a colonoscopy if you haven't. You know, um, the doctor did say that if I had not gotten uh, the, the blood work done and the colonoscopy done, 
within that 12 months, within another 12 months that the cancer would have uh, um, spread through my liver and my lungs and, and it, it could have gone to a stage four. And at that point, there's really nothing they could do for you besides maintain you and keep you going. But as far as curing it, it was, it would have been too, too, too late. Alex, then let's, uh, let's back up a little bit. I want to talk a little bit more about your reversal procedure for those, yeah. for people listening who, uh, who might be a candidate for a reversal procedure, uh, fill them in on what that entails. So I had to get an exam prior to the reversal. Uh, I knew that doc the doctor had said he wanted me to have the, the bag for three months. I had it for almost two and a half months, almost three months three months and does is that on the reversal is it allows the intestine to heal and so they can reconnect it it's basically like I mentioned like it's like a garden hose you just reconnect it and then you um, you know they, that's it they just put staples on it and they let you stay in the hospital for a couple of days while they see that you're you know passing gas and you're actually going to the bathroom and producing the stool samples but um, prior to that I had to do an exam similar to a colonoscopy where they give you, it's kind of like a, it's like a, it's a, an enema where they shoot contrast and it's a CAT scan and they go up your rectum and they want to make sure that everything's been healed. It's not a pleasant procedure. Um, but what I had already had gone through, I really didn't care what I had to do to get done, but it, it, that, that's the, uh, that was the reversal part. Um, how it went down but the, the, the most important thing about it is the time uh, for the procedure to happen. So, for example, they wanted me to have it on for three months, so I did have it on for three months, and uh, they just wanted it to heal, Bruce, more than anything. Okay, and uh, wh where will you say your cancer journey is at now? You've had the reversal procedure to some degree, maybe not, certainly not 100%, but... Uh, in large part, it almost sounds like you're back to normal. I feel great, Bruce. Um, again, to the grace of God and my faith and my family support, my friends and everybody who knows me, um, I feel great. I, I, you know, I, I look a little bit better. I know when I first got out, I, my, I didn't look that hot. Um, but as far as my journey is right now, I'm going every three months for CAT scan and blood work for, I believe it's the first year. And then after that, it's yearly uh, exams. Uh, but more importantly, uh, I have to just constantly have a, a better diet, stay away from sodas is what he said, because um, cancer likes to breed around soda and carbonation. Uh, I, don't, I'm, I wasn't really a big pop drinker anyway, so that didn't affect me. But just overall, just changing your diet uh, eating better food, trying to stay away from fast food. Um, I have a nutritionist now that tells me kind of what I can and can't eat, uh, what I should and shouldn't eat. Um, so a lot of it is information to be educated. Ex educate yourself on on having a better way of living life because, you know, there were some nights when I was in the hospital, Bruce, for those 23 days where – I didn't know if I was going to leave. I had no idea. I'm like, when am I going to leave? And they were just, every day the doctor would come in and say, hey, you know, we're going to keep you another day, another two days, another three days, another three days. And I just got to the point where I just, I had, I, I was losing faith. I was losing hope. And um, But as far as my cancer journey is right now, I'm, I'm, I'm in remission. Um, I'm able to uh, eat normal, go to the bathroom normal. I'm sleeping like, like a like a brand new baby um so um, I got, i'm getting my rest i need i'm getting the food and the nutrients i need i'm gaining weight slowly um i kind of like my weight at 190 195 i think 215 220 was a little too big for me i, I have uh kicked pretty much diabetes now because of my weight loss uh i don't have to take a thousand milligrams anymore i'm just only taking 500 so there has been a little bit of a benefit of losing this weight but um I used to take cholesterol pills. I don't take those anymore. Um, I used to have high blood pressure. I don't have any high blood pressure anymore. So I guess it was a blessing in disguise in some ways. And in some ways, you know, if I can get one person out there, one of your audience, one of your, your listeners or 
someone who follows the podcast like I do to watch this interview and, and get anything from me would be to, or, you know, to check yourself. All right. Now you had already addressed something that I was going to bring up and that was uh, uh, weight gain. And you've, you've had weight gain that is, that is, uh, that is positive in nature. In other words, you've gotten back some of that weight, but not too much. So that sounds about right. But if you look back at, at your entire journey, where you've been to and back, uh, what is your feeling now, Alex? Uh, is it uh, relief, gratitude, anything else that, uh, again, that, that you've gone as far as you have and, and it seems like you've come almost all the way back, knowing what could have happened and knowing where you are now? How does all that feel? Well, I'll tell you what. So I'll go back to what I do for a living. Uh, I also I do a lot of different kind of broadcasting. So one of, the, one of my jobs I do is I'm a, I'm a ring announcer for boxing. And recently, uh, I was at a at a boxing fight, which was interesting because the date of that boxing fight, four months prior to that, I was in an ICU room in a bath of cold ice water because my temperature was so high that they had to put me in the bath water. And that's the night I went septic, and that's when I thought that that was it. Um, so when you when you see what I've learned, I've learned a lot. I've learned to, to appreciate life and the reason why i bring up the boxing thing is i, I sat there for a minute there was about 4500 fans in the, in the in the arena and i'm here announcing the fights and i'm look i'm looking back at myself and going look where i'm standing right now and where i was four months ago to just think that you know if you have faith and you have the right attitude and, and another thing too is attitude you got to be positive during any kind of cancer journey, you know, you got to stay positive. You have to have good spirits because if you don't, you know, that, I think that can really put you in the dumps. Um, you got to have a good support system, which I did. Uh, but my lesson that I've learned is, you know, don't take – life is so precious. You can be gone in one minute. And, you know, don't just pray when things are going, you know, bad. Pray when things are, you know, things are going good. You know, don't just reach, you know, and, and I, I use my faith a lot, Bruce. So if, if some of, the, you know, your listeners out there are God-fearing people like myself, my faith got me through this. I knew my faith was strong, but I didn't know how strong. And, you know, it's brought me closer to our Lord and our Savior to know that he's in control. I'm not. You know, he could have easily said, you know, it's time to go. But he, he, he didn't do that. So what I do now in return is I try to spread the word. I, I, want, I want to make sure that people can live through vicariously through me and, you know, do what I'm doing. The, the different things I do in life now, I, I hope I'm inspiring people to say, look, if Alex was in the dumps and he was, you know, sick and, and he's able to get out of it. Now he's, he's, you know, he's talking to a national audience on cancer survivors, you know, talking to the great Bruce Morton, you know, um, if, if, if people can, you know, just look at my story and say, you know what, if he can do it, I can do it. And that's, that's what I, I want people to understand through my journey. My journey has just begun, Bruce. Yes. Yeah, just because I'm in remission, that doesn't mean it's not there. It's there. It just hasn't woken up yet or is the, the cancer hasn't come back, but it can. And I know that there's a 20% chance that could happen. And I just want to make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm able to, you know, to listen to my friends if they have problems. I'm more sympathetic now more than anything. I, I, I catch myself watching, um, you know, testimonials on other people's lives, listening to Cancer Survivors podcast on your YouTube was amazing. Uh, one of your interviews with Dry Doc, just powerful stuff. So if you are listening to this podcast, I, I, I strongly urge you and I implore everybody if you're going through any kind of cancer battle or you're or you just got out or you're about to start your journey check out the podcast these these stories will inspire you um, I know they've inspired me I, I know that uh, it's interesting how how you and I came our, our, our paths crossed Bruce and I, I believe now there's a reason for that and um, I appreciate it thank you for uh having me on this platform because it's, it's, this is something I'm going to always cherish forever. You know, I want to make sure if I can talk to any, if someone wants to reach out to me, 
um, you know, send, send Bruce Morton an email. There's all the contact information will be on there. If you want to talk to me, I'm open. I'm, I'm an open book. You know, if you have questions about ostomy or well, how did I do it? What, what materials I used? Cause everybody's body is different. So for example, the ostomy bag, I have a pretty flat stomach, but not everybody has a flat stomach. They have curves or they have, you know, you know, just different, bo everybody has a different body type. So there's different kind of bags and different kind of tapes and different kind of adhesives that will help, you know, and I know that if someone was there to help me guide me through that process, that would have made my life easier, but I had to navigate that journey on my own and through trial and error. And I, I learned, I just, I overcame it. So if anybody can, if everybody's watching this, this podcast, just, know that there's hope there is hope as long as you keep your faith and, and your spirits up you know you, you, you can you can survive anything uh, i'm really i'm a firm believer of that bruce alex by the way the the guest that you referenced a couple of minutes ago his name is uh dan drydock shockley and he is a yes, survivor sir. of colorectal cancer he is one of our guests on one of, on one of our previous interviews now alex we've got to the point in the uh, in the episode here in which we're going to wrap up and we always wrap up in the same sort of way with the same question. The only challenge for me is uh, trying to figure out how to ask this just right, because you've covered just about every possible base I could ask you to cover in this last question. But basically where we like to finish up is to ask our guest, in this case yourself, if you were speaking one-on-one -on -one with somebody who had just been diagnosed with your type of cancer or any type of cancer, you, again, you've already covered just about every base, but if you could think of one that tops all others, one overarching message to that person, what would it be? You know, and what, one of the things, I, I will say this, that I've, I've actually volunteered my time at St. Anthony's Hospital to speak to patients roughly around my age that are, that are going through this, and I appreciate you asking that because, um, I, I, I want to be, I, I want there to be a support system. I, I want, I want you to understand that what you're about to start, the journey you're about to be on, it, it, it can be lonely, but you need to ask the questions that I did not know. I, when I first got sent to, after my operation, I was on the sixth floor and I'm walking around with my IV and it said the cancer unit. And I was like, what am I doing here? Like it had not settled, like it had not resonated on me that I had cancer. And I asked one of the nurses, I'm like, why am I doing in the sixth floor? She's like, oh, you're, you, you have cancer, sir. You're, but it's all been taken care of. They removed everything. And it just, it took a while for that to settle in and sit in me. But I will tell this, ask questions. If you don't know something, ask, write, have a notepad with you. Um, sometimes during anesthesia or during, uh, excuse me, not anesthesia, but during the pain medication, you, you, you have an idea or you have a question you want to ask the doctor, write it down. So the next time he comes in or a nurse comes in and go, oh, I got a question for you. I hear, I'm going to ask you this. What's this for? What is this part? What is this, uh, uh, you know, device do? Or what, why am I taking this specific pill for this? Ask questions, get informed, educate yourself, uh, Go on the websites, uh, coloncancer.com. There are many support groups you can find. I didn't find that stuff until later in my journey. But if I knew what I was about to go through, what I know now, I would have done more research. I would have looked into what an ostomy bag was. I had no idea what that was until I walked out of the hospital. I'm like, what, what, what is this? And then I had to figure it out. And there are support groups out there. Um, there's information all over the place about uh, colon cancer and how to survive it. You know, I, and I, I, I would say refrain from going to Google and, you know, diagnosing yourself. Go to websites that are reputable. Go to, uh, you know, websites that actually are, are, you know, sponsored by the FDA and they're, you know, approved by uh, the Cancer Society because there's a lot of information out there that's misleading or you can misdiagnose yourself by going onto a website that it doesn't give you accurate information. But my, my, my best advice would be ask questions. If you don't know something, write it down and then ask again. 
Um, but there is hope out there for our, our, our audience out there today that's watching or listening to my story. Um, I implore you not to give up. I, I pray for you not to give up. Um, like I said, Bruce, if anybody out there wants to reach out to me and talk to me directly, I'd be more than happy to do that. I think it's my, you know, my legacy now on, on this planet is to help people navigate through what I've gone through. And hopefully that's why I'm still here. I'm here to help. Um, and this platform, I will say this, uh, with Cancer Survivors, this podcast is, man, Joe Rogan better watch out. Bruce Morton, because you're coming, you're coming after him and what you're doing and, and your organization and your group and your foundation, what you guys are, what you guys represent. Um, you know, I, I give you, I, I, I want to call you a friend of mine and I just want to say thank you for allowing me uh, this platform. What you guys are doing is God's work and, and I appreciate you, buddy. Alex, thanks so much. Uh, this is a story that checks the two biggest boxes that we want to check whenever we have an interview with someone on this podcast, because we're not purveyors of medical advice, but we do want to be providers of information and inspiration. And that, Alex, you have given our listeners and viewers in spades. So that's going to wrap up this segment of Cancer Interviews. Alex, we want to thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much thank for you. being with us. I appreciate you. And God bless you, Bruce, and everybody out there. Hang in there, and, and remember, it's you that makes today special. Exactly. As we like to say, T-E-A-M, together, everybody achieves more. So until next time, we'll see you down the road. Thanks for joining us today. For more information, please visit us online at cancerinterviews.com. We appreciate you tuning in, and we'll see you back here again next time on the Cancer Interviews Podcast.